really uh, thank you all for coming very much. It's been uh, kind of a chilly, a chilly morning, but uh, Phil Benoit's going to warm it up for us with a very positive presentation about the IEA and what the, some of its latest work on energy efficiency and uh, and uh, related policy issues. Uh, so uh, we're very pleased to uh, have Phil Benoit back with us again. Is this the third time? Second, Th second time. And uh, he's the head of the Energy Efficiency and Environment Division at the IEA. And uh, as those of you who follow the IEA's work closely realize, uh, you know, the work that IEA has done over the years on energy efficiency and technology has probably, you know, been less recognized than maybe some of the other things, but probably, in my view, some of the most important work in the last, in the IEA's existence, which is getting close to, uh, I guess it's 40 years this year. Uh, 40 years. Oh. As if we we need a reminder, yeah. So, uh, in uh, recent years, in the U.S. legislation that relates to energy, the, the probably the one thing that does have bipartisan support is energy efficiency matters. And if you look at some of the uh, the uh, positive developments that have occurred in, in recent years of the U.S. It's been those uh, energy efficiency standards, energy efficiency uh, rules and regulation uh, that that really have made a, a difference. And if, and if you think about the, the goals that the uh, president has set for this country and, uh, and, and our other member countries in the IEA have set a uh, big share of that. And We'll be reminded of that again uh, by Phil's presentation today on the 18 countries that are covered in this report, but then uh, in about 10 days, what, 24th, uh, Fatih Birol will be here to present the global view, which also highlights energy efficiency as uh, probably the most important element in uh, reaching uh, not only environment goals, but uh, economic efficiency goals. So uh, we're going to, Phil's going to make about a 30 minute presentation or so, then we'll open it up to Q&A and we look forward to having uh, interaction. And once again, uh, thank you, Phil, for coming and thank you all for uh, being here. Phil? Thanks, Guy. Thanks for those uh, kind words of uh, introduction. It's a real pleasure to be back here. Uh, this is the second time because uh, this is the second uh, market report that we've issued. Uh, and we always start uh, with a visit to Washington and to CIS uh, to present our findings. I think you've touched on uh, some of the important points that uh, I was actually going to raise at the end and maybe I'll raise at the beginning uh, in terms of energy efficiency. I mean, what we see uh, when it comes to energy efficiency uh, is a economic energy uh, fuel, basically, that can substitute for supply-side interventions uh, that generates uh, a lot of benefits, uh, generates um, climate benefits, but it also uh, generates uh, other important benefits in terms of uh, supporting economic development, improving access. Uh, fundamentally, we think of labor productivity, we think of capital productivity, we need to think about energy productivity, not always uh, simply energy intensity. It's not a question necessarily of uh, using less energy for each dollar of GDP. It's often a question of generating as many dollars of GDP for every unit of energy that is used. Uh, and this is particularly uh, a critical issue uh, when we look at emerging economies and developing countries. Um, so one of the challenges I think that we do face is on the one hand, uh, under IA analysis, energy efficiency is the most important contributor to achieving the type of decarbonization that is required to achieve our climate goal aspirations. Uh, but at the same time, uh, for many countries, it's important for them to recognize that energy efficiency can meet uh, a variety of objectives. So something that uh, we have tried to do uh, over the recent past, the very recent past, 
at the IA is to complement some of the uh, analytic work that we do with work that is uh, fundamentally in many ways designed to reposition uh, energy efficiency. Uh, so for example, uh, at the IA we have a lot of uh, fuel market reports. We've had fuel market reports, uh, we started with oil, we moved into coal and gas, and a couple of years ago uh, we started uh, a fuel market report uh, with the renewable fuel. And we sort of felt that uh, uh, we needed to look at energy efficiency in a similar way. Why? Because uh, at the end of the day, you can put solar panels on your roof or you can put uh, insulation in your home. Both of them serve to satisfy uh, an energy, a demand for energy services. They just do it in different ways. So uh, a couple of years ago, we thought, well, we should uh, look at energy efficiency maybe in a similar way. We should look at what the market looks like. And that actually presented a variety of challenges. Uh, one of the question was really defining and sizing uh, the market. Uh, to be frank, uh, when we raised the notion of having a fuel market report, there were many who were skeptical. They said, what uh, is the market for uh, energy efficiency? And I think many people were coming and thinking about the market for oil, a nice integrated global market. Uh, but you know, the fact of the matter is when you look at renewables, it's not as integrated. And clearly when we're getting into energy efficiency, it becomes even more diffuse. But Fundamentally, the way we uh, chose to define the market uh, is to recognize that uh, many people are spending money for goods and services that will generate uh, an energy efficient result. Sometimes they do it uh, on purpose and in buying insulation. Sometimes uh, they're required to do it because there's a, a mandate uh, out there. But at the end of the day, there's uh, a lot of money that's being spent to generate uh, a more efficient outcome. So inputs and outputs and then one of the real challenges we had is, okay, uh, how do you actually try to evaluate what that market looks like at a global level? And I'll come back to that. Second thing uh, was a recognition that we're looking at a very diffuse market operating in a variety of sectors. You could say uh, for each way that we use energy, there's a corresponding energy efficiency uh, investment or typology that's taking place. So uh, diffuse and varied, but uh, having said that, what we saw while it's very local and sectoral, there were certain common elements that we were able uh, to pick upon. Third thing, uh, in IEA market reports, it's important to talk about prospects. So that's one thing that we've touched upon. What, where do we see the energy efficiency market going? And lastly, one of the major problems that we faced in, in doing this market report, it was true the first year, and it's been true this year, and will continue to be true, but we hope to do a better job of this, is we face uh, a lot of uh, data and methodological challenges. Uh, we often don't have the type of quality of data that one has, uh, for example, when you look at the oil market or even if you look at renewables, uh, and then there are a lot of methodological challenges. Uh, what should we count uh, as the energy efficiency component when you buy a more efficient refrigerator that provides a lot of other services. But notwithstanding these, these challenges, we felt that was uh, important uh, to move ahead uh, and to really uh, reflect the fact that uh, there is a market out there for uh, energy efficiency. Uh, and last year, uh, we had our inaugural report and out with the old and in with the new. And this year, we have our new, our second annual energy efficiency uh, market report, which I will describe to you today. So what are some of the ch changes from last year's? Uh, the first is uh, we reinforced and uh, came up with what we feel are more robust methodologies for uh, trying to size the market. Uh, each year we've decided to focus on a particular uh, subject area. Last year we focused in on uh, ICT, and this year we focused in on transport and finance. Uh, as uh, Guy has uh, remarked, uh, we were able to expand our analysis in a variety of areas from 11 IA countries to 18 countries. Again, this is a reflection of the data challenge that we, we face. We have to be looking at consistent data to be able to aggregate things. Uh, we've done a new decomposition uh, methodology, uh, which is more precise, and that's how we can try to uh, isolate out the energy efficiency impact from structural impacts and the like. I'll come back to that. And, and we have more energy efficiency indicators that we're tracking. So here's uh, just the table of context which helps to sort of describe what's in the report. Uh, first part really deals with some global issues, trying to estimate the market and the like with a focus on transport 
and finance. And then what we do is we go in in the second part and look at how the market is playing out in a variety of individual countries. So in terms of the market estimations, uh, what we did is this year we looked at five uh, different methodologies. Uh, just to go through them briefly, the first is uh, we basically took, looked at, okay, what is the capital uh, formation uh, over the last year? We took a certain percentage of that, assuming that that reflected the energy efficiency component and came out with a figure. The second thing we did was uh, we, did, we looked at changes in global energy intensity. Uh, we basically tried to remove the activity impact in terms of impact on total final consumption. Uh, as well as changes in economy, structural changes, and came up with a figure. Uh, we went through five, and interestingly enough, all of the, all of the uh, different methodologies produced the similar types of results, and basically uh, a result that uh, the overall global market for energy efficiency using these top-down methodologies uh, uh, came in at about 310 to $360 billion. Uh, which was consistent with the $300 billion estimate that uh, we had uh, last year. So increasing comfort around that number, but having said that, really still a need to do uh, more work and to improve both the data and the methodological issues. And what you have here is a collection of the results from a Monte Carlo analysis, which was the fourth one. And what's uh, notable here, these are the results uh, that you have when you do, you basically uh, vary some of the inputs. Uh, according to certain distribution curves. And what's uh, striking in this result is that, if anything, we probably tend to see the possibility that the market may be larger uh, than what we were thinking. But fundamentally, uh, we're getting increasingly comfortable uh, with the notion that the global market for energy efficiency probably sits somewhere in the $300 billion range. And I think equally important, and coming back to this issue of prospects, is that we see signals that point to, to further growth. Um, Guy mentioned, I don't know if you mentioned it right now or right uh, before, uh, you mentioned the agreement between uh, China and the United States uh, on the climate issue. Clearly, uh, energy efficiency is going to be an important way in which uh, both countries uh, can try to achieve that. The European Union just came out uh, with a target, non-binding, of 27 percent uh, reduction uh, in uh, primary energy consumption. Uh, what we see is increasingly countries uh, looking to energy efficiency to meet a variety of goals. Uh, and what we see with uh, increased policy attention is the prospect for increased growth in the market. Obviously, one of the other major drivers is uh, just uh, where we sit in terms of uh, energy prices. Uh, and those uh, tend to be, um, uh, I guess some people view them maybe as a little lower than they were uh, three years ago, but clearly they're, they're much higher than where they were 10 or 12 years ago. So fundamentally, uh, our sense is that signals point to further growth uh, in the energy efficiency market. Um, the other thing is, and this is really more repeat from uh, some uh, one of the conclusions from last year, is if we look at the size of that market, uh, it's larger uh, than the amount of investments that were made in uh, renewable uh, power generation and the like. So it's really, it is a, a sizable, sizable market, not obviously uh, smaller than where we are in terms of upstream oil and gas, but uh, really a big market and a big market when we think about efforts uh, to decarbonize uh, the energy sector. This is the actual market. So when we look at the basically um, the IEA's market report uh, on renewables estimates that the market for renewables is about investments in power generation is about 200, 220, 30, 40, 50 billion dollars. And we estimate that the amount of money that's being spent on energy efficiency investments is, is uh, larger, about $300 billion. So this is consistent with our estimation, again, with the major caveat that we still face major data and methodological uh, challenges uh, that these other sectors don't face. And then the other, the other big uh, uh, conclusion is that uh, based on uh, the 11 countries, the 11 IA countries that we were able to analyze, uh, and that includes some of the largest uh, OECD economies, if we look at uh, the contribution of different fuels to total final consumption in 2011, what you see is obviously a large amount uh, of uh, the contribution to total final consumption coming from oil, a uh, lesser amount from gas, a lesser amount from coal, a larger amount from electricity, and obviously that includes some coal as well. And if we compare that uh, to the amount of energy savings 
that were generated in 2011 from uh, investments in energy efficiency over the preceding several decades, our conclusion is that there, were more, there was more in terms of energy savings from energy efficiency investments in 2011 than any other fuel contributed to actual consumption. So that's also how we term, came up with this term of uh, energy efficiency as the first fuel. And, and let me go to this next graph, which helps to sort of just illustrate this point. So what you have here is basically you start from 1970s, for, and that's a, a point where we had data, and you look at what the world looked like and you look at what the energy intensity looked like, sorry, for these 11 IA countries for which we had data. And then over time, you look at actual contribution to total final consumption, which is basically the red, the blue, and the like, and you compare that to what would total final consumption have been if we hadn't had energy efficiency investments? And if you just then focus on 2011, what you see is what I presented in the previous graph. That basically the green bar, which is how much we, uh, energy efficiency uh, improvements over the preceding decades generated in terms of uh, savings in 2011 as compared to the amount of oil or electricity or natural gas that uh, contributed to total final consumption in these uh, 11 IA countries. And that's our calculation of how we end up with uh, energy efficiency being the first fuel. And then it's also interesting to compare that figure to actual total final consumption in a variety of regions. So for example, we have that 1,300 million tons of oil equivalent saved in 2011. And if you look at Asia, excluding China, it actually consumed less in terms of total final consumption. China, uh, the amount of savings from the IA11 countries was about 80% of what China cons used in terms of total final consumption. And the IA, for the, the savings was larger than the entire total final consumption of the European Union and represented about 80, 87% of what the United States does. So basically what we see is energy efficiency investments are generating over time savings that basically displace the entire total fund of consumption of some continents and, and some regions. And let me just also point out when I mentioned before that we looked at 30, 40 uh, years uh, because that's where we had data, it's important to recognize that that long time frame is relevant and appropriate we feel when you're looking uh, at the amount of savings because after all, when you build a home and you put insulation in there, I used to live in Potomac, I lived in a home that was built after the oil embargo, uh, it was a very tight home from an energy perspective, uh, a lot of insulation, a lot of windows that uh, were, were efficient, very little uh, 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 air movement in there and obviously over the 20, 30, 40 years, that home continues to generate that type of uh, benefits. Now obviously cars come and go and the like, so they're there the capital stock is a different type of movement, but you do have this benefit over time. And then the other thing is if you think about, for example, coal-powered plants or renewables, hydropower plants, many plants have been operating for 20, 30 years, and we count their contribution in the total final uh, consumption figures that we have. So in some ways we feel it's very appropriate to look at this uh, extended time frame uh, to figure out where we are. Bottom line is uh, energy efficiency is truly an invisible powerhouse when it comes to uh, meeting energy demand for energy services. So what was also interesting to do is to try to figure out uh, and to try to identify uh, using improved methodologies uh, what is the impact of energy efficiency as opposed to the impact of changes uh, in the structure of the economy uh, or the impact of increasing population and economic growth on a total final consumption. Uh, one of the improvements I had mentioned that we had made is we improved the methodology in terms of our what we call our decomposition analysis. We were able to go from 11 to 18 countries and we were able to use a methodology also that we felt was more precise. And this sort of uh, reflects the result of that. So what you have here with the blue line starting in 2001, which represents uh, the base of 100, is you have what should total final consumption have looked like in these 18 IEA countries if you simply factored in uh, the impact of population growth 
uh, and uh, increase in the economy, changes in the economy. And what you see, for example, is from 2007 to 2009, you have a reduction in total final consumption, which obviously is tied to uh, the recession. So that is what total final consumption should have looked like if we had simply uh, had uh, the world remaining unchanged in terms of energy efficiency uh, and the like. What's significant there is a increase in total final consumption uh, through 2011. We do the same analysis, just looking at changes in structure. Uh, and basically that's as, for example, you move from uh, intensive uh, industries to uh, less energy intensive services, uh, the amount of energy unit that's required for each GDP is less. So as the economy, the structure of the economy changes, that'll have an impact on total final consumption. We strip that out as well. And this is actually what total final consumption actually was uh, in these IEA 18 countries. And what you see is that basically uh, something has happened because if you look at the impact of activity, increasing ec economic activity and population growth, uh, as well as structural adjustments, you have a total final consumption that really should have been higher than what it actually was. And the reason it was lower is because of the impact of energy efficiency. And so the green line, which is the key line, shows uh, what uh, total final consumption uh, would have been like as a result of energy efficiency investments. And so bottom line is that energy efficiency is uh, effectively serving to uh, reduce total final consumption in the face of increasing population and economic growth. That's the fundamental important message that we see here. And that's also reflected when we look at a breakdown uh, by countries. And what you see here is that in 12 of the 18 countries that we studied, uh, energy efficiency improvements, which are the green bars, uh, were able to more than compensate for increases in population uh, and uh, economic growth, resulting in the little circles, which is actually what uh, was the change in total final consumption. So uh, energy efficiency improvements were greater uh, than uh, growth uh, having a dampening impact on total final consumption of energy. Now, one of the areas that I mentioned that we looked at was uh, transport. Uh, and what we see in transport is a lot of the energy efficiency market uh, is driven by uh, vehicle fuel economy standards. Uh, what you see in the graph reflected there uh, are uh, the solid lines are the actual uh, fuel economy results and the dotted lines are prospective fuel economy standards. Uh, and what we see is that this is really a, a global phenomenon. Uh, European Union, the United States, obviously there's a lot of discussion about the fuel economy standards here. Uh, but even India, China, other countries are really uh, looking at fuel economy standards uh, as an important way uh, to manage a variety of issues, uh, including uh, fuel imports, which obviously in a country like uh, Japan and, and Korea are, are critical to uh, uh, energy security issues and the like. And I think uh, what's interesting, uh, as reflected in the first bullet, is that 50 million uh, vehicles sold in 2011 uh, were sold uh, in countries that have fuel economy standards and that represents over 70% of the new vehicle fleet. Um, the other point uh, is that uh, improving standards uh, can achieve a major fuel savings by uh, 2020, depending uh, in some ways on how aggressive uh, countries are in terms of pursuing those things. So uh, when we look at the transport sector, uh, what we see uh, is that energy efficiency is a big part uh, of that uh, transport market, and put it another way, uh, that if we think about the energy efficiency market, uh, a lot of the activity is going to take place uh, in the transport sector uh, in terms of uh, increased spending for more efficient vehicles. But when we think about transport and we think about efficiency, it's not simply a question uh, of making uh, the particular engine or vehicle more efficient. What you have reflected uh, in the bottom chart uh, is the fact uh, that uh, road transport towards the right, whether it's for freight or passengers, is a less efficient way of moving goods uh, and people than freight rail and the like. And so when we think about efficiency uh, as a general proposition, being more uh, efficient in terms of our energy use to move people uh, and uh, freight, uh, it's not simply a question of improving uh, the efficiency of the uh, 
car or, a, or of the locomotive, there's also an issue in terms of shifting uh, between modes of transport. Um, now that is probably not what one would classically think of in terms of maybe the energy efficiency market, but the fact of the matter is, and uh, something that became evident to us as we were uh, looking more deeply at this issue of the energy efficiency market for transport, ultimately our objective uh, is to achieve more uh, energy efficient transport of people and freight, so shifts uh, in mode uh, are going to be an important part of that, and this is obviously uh, something that uh, is going to be uh, it's increasingly important uh, in, in Europe and even the United States where there's a lot of discussion about rail or uh, urban transport and the like. Uh, but countries like Brazil are building metro systems. Uh, and if anybody has visited any major city in any major emerging economy, I'm sure you're all very sensitive to the massive traffic jams uh, that they face. So the whole issue uh, of uh, shifting or maybe in some ways in those uh, countries preventing a shift to uh, light duty vehicles will be an important part of the uh, energy efficiency story in the transport sector, uh, and obviously uh, those type of investments in, in mass, rail and the like, uh, involve a significant amount of investment in infrastructure. The other shift that's important to, to think about uh, is a geographic shift. So what you see uh, in these two diagrams, uh, the green line is uh, projected uh, world uh, uh, transport, the dark blue line is what's expected to happen in OECD countries, and basically it's expected to remain flat. Uh, and all of the increase in terms of uh, transport demand is going to come from non-OECD uh, countries. So uh, when we think about the energy efficiency market, uh, what we see is uh, a likely uh, increase uh, for potential investments in energy efficiency in transport really being centered around uh, emerging economies. So as mentioned, the other, the other area of focus that we, that we dealt with uh, in this market report was looking at the issue of finance. Um, and what you have here uh, is a breakdown that the IE did in terms of where we see the sources of financing. Now, what's interesting and maybe in some ways not so surprising is that the dark blue lines, which represent nearly 55, 60 percent of sources of financing is internally generated cash. And at the end of the day, uh, the fact of the matter is when I go out and I buy a CFL for my home, I'm not borrowing money to buy that CFL. I'm using uh, savings and earnings to do that. That's what a lot of companies do. But having said that, uh, a significant portion uh, of, the, of the investment will come from third party sources of financing that's uh, principally debt uh, as well as some equity. So that represents about 40 percent. So when we superimpose that on our market, what we see is really uh, an estimated uh, large uh, financing market for energy efficiency. Uh, we see a market that uh, is expanding and continuously innovating. Um, we estimate uh, that the amount of financing uh, that went into that 300 or plus billion market, if you apply a 40 percent rule, is in the range of $120 billion. Um, and much of that actually uh, came from, uh, that we were able to identify, came from bilateral and multilateral development aid. Uh, there's a great activity of the public sector in trying to promote energy efficiency. Uh, some of that is public sector money that's going into domestic programs. Uh, so for example, KFW, uh, uh, has a program to encourage uh, retrofit investments uh, in Germany. The United States uh, also tries to put in place programs like, uh, similar to that, uh, guarantee programs and the like. But there's also a significant amount of money uh, that we were able to identify uh, that is coming from uh, places like the World Bank, uh, KFW's development aid, where basically it's countries that are providing financing to uh, developing countries uh, to support investment in energy efficiency and we were able to identify uh, over $22 billion worth of that in 2012. I think the critical issue or the most important issue is that we see uh, financiers becoming increasingly uh, comfortable uh, with uh, tools to finance energy efficiency. So in that regard, we see it moving from a, a niche product to more of an established financial market segment. Having said that, I think what we recognize is uh, at the end of the day, uh, many, many banks, too many banks still remain unfamiliar 
uh, with what's required in terms of uh, energy efficiency investment. So there's needs to be continued emphasis uh, in, in increasing familiarity with that. And I think at the end of the day, when you'll see a lot of banks that are familiar uh, with doing that, then you'll probably see an increase in the amount of funding. If, if I could just uh, parenthetically make an observation, in some ways, it's really not that surprising that it becomes uh, more difficult to do an energy efficiency financing than another one because at the end of the day you're dealing with the counterfactual energy savings. So if I could give an illustration, and I'd spent uh, many years uh, as an investment banker uh, doing energy projects. So if you're going to finance a, a power plant and you're a bank, you basically have to, you have to get comfortable with the technology that the power plant is going to work. Uh, and, then, and then what you need to do is you need to get comfortable that the utility that's going to buy the money from the power plant has the money to pay for it. And then you know pretty much uh, what the cost, uh, the, the price at which the, it's going to be sold, and you do your revenues uh, calculation. So you're basically sitting there looking at an electricity power generation technology and electricity power generation purchaser and the like. But if you compare that to, uh, for example, promoting uh, energy efficiency retrofits for commercial buildings, on the one hand, you have to get comfortable with the fact that the technology that people are proposing will actually uh, produce the result. Um, so more efficient boilers, uh, more efficient lighting. Uh, well, I notice you have windows here. The whole placement of the windows and the like are designed uh, often to, to produce a, a result. You need less artificial lighting in here if you were upstairs, uh, uh, and, and the like. So you have to get comfortable that the technology will produce uh, the type of savings that you want. But at the same time, basically, where is uh, the owner of the commercial space going to get their money? They're not going to get it from generating energy. They're going to get it from renting out the commercial space. So you have to also get comfortable with what is the commercial real estate market going to look like uh, in this part of Washington. So you have to really look at two completely different types of phenomena. The uh, technical operation of a variety of energy efficiency investments, as well as the commercial real estate market. And that's, I think, in some ways a, a, a somewhat more daunting prospect uh, for financiers. So I think there are some structural reasons why it's been more difficult, but having said that, banks uh, do much more complicated things. It's really just a question of uh, getting them uh, comfortable with that. So this whole movement away from a, a niche product to more of an established financial market is something that we see that is ongoing and which we feel will have an important impact. And then the other thing is greater transparency and standards for financial products will also uh, help uh, in, in this regard. What you have here is a reflection of uh, an ESCO market that is extremely large. What we did in the finance chapters, we focused in on certain aspects, and I think what's most notable here is a uh, $12 billion uh, dollar market uh, in China, $6 billion dollar market in the United States, so uh, very large in very large countries with a possibility, obviously, in China to grow significantly. Then we also looked at uh, country case studies that help in some ways uh, enrich the, uh, in s the more uh, theoretical analysis and gives specific examples. A large focus here on Asia, but just to take you through a couple, uh, we looked uh, at China, where one of the major drivers for energy efficiency investments is the five-year plans. We compared the 11th to the 12th. And what's interesting is you see a relatively uh, consistent uh, level of investment, slightly higher under the 12th year plan uh, as compared to the, to the 11th year plan. But the amount of uh, energy savings that's expected uh, to, be to be produced is less. Uh, and I think in some ways that's a reflection of two important dynamics. The first is that uh, in China, they've been dealing with energy efficiency uh, for a number of five-year plans now, and you could argue that some of the lower-hanging fruits have been taking up, so you're getting to the point uh, your the cost-effectiveness of any particular investment uh, diminishes. Uh, and then the second thing is more of a focus now on capacity building and training uh, as well, a, a sense that there's a need to in improve the expertise. And I think that's, again, consistent with the fact that uh, kind of as you move up the supply curve, things become more challenging and having greater capacity uh, becomes uh, important. Continued uh, leadership from the European Union, uh, as reflected, one could argue, in the recent uh, decision to have a 27 percent non-binding target uh, in terms of uh, uh, consumption, primary consumption. Uh, I think uh, some people were disappointed. Some people were hoping for 30 percent. They may revisit that. Uh, but uh, over time, uh, clearly a, a real uh, emphasis from the European Union on this, and increasingly 
uh, also motivated by some energy security issues, clearly uh, uh, the concerns that Ukraine faces in terms of uh, gas imports then also bleeds over in terms into uh, issues for the European Union is facing. And interestingly enough, so this report was issued the day after uh, the uh, Nobel Prize for Physics was, uh, uh, was given to the uh, Japanese inventors of LEDs. Uh, and here you see a real illustration of how uh, technology uh, can generate uh, a market. Uh, in Japan, uh, LED sales grew through from 100 a million in 2007 to uh, 4 billion in, in 2013. So uh, the real, uh, real development and real explosion of an energy efficiency market generated by technology. So in some of the key findings, uh, energy efficiency market is a significant component of the global energy system, one that has been too often overlooked and one that is uh, becoming increasingly important uh, given, among other things, uh, uh, climate uh, change mitigation aspirations. Secondly, as I'd mentioned, it's a market that uh, we project uh, will grow uh, with drivers uh, strengthening. Uh, and thirdly, that uh, policy, strong policies and standardization and the like will support it. Now, what I would like to do now is to actually touch briefly on a, another related work stream that we have. Because as I'd mentioned at the beginning, one of the issues that we see uh, is uh, energy efficiency that is underinvested, an underinvestment in energy efficiency. And when we think about one of some of the reasons for that, uh, we feel that in some ways it's because uh, energy efficiency remained too long uh, an overly technical uh, energy fuel, energy uh, instrument uh, that was only considered by energy efficiency uh, experts uh, and maybe a few other ones, uh, uh, rather than something like renewables where there was a real ability to capture the imagination uh, of the public. Uh, my kids often come home and they have uh, an assignment and their assignment has to do with renewable energy. They don't really often come home and have an assignment that has to do with energy invest, uh, energy efficiency. So what we want to do is figure out a way to build bridges to uh, other stakeholders in government and the private sector to, to sort of draw them into seeing what are the advantages of energy efficiency. And what you have here is advantages that manifest themselves at an individual level and national level, fuel imports and the like, international climate change. So we want to build uh, bridges to more stakeholders and also figure out a way to do a better job of capturing the imagination of the public. Because at the end of the day, what we recognize is that we are all operating with scarce resources, whether they're financial resources or even in terms of time and attention. And what we need to do is to figure out a way to get people to better prioritize energy efficiency in a manner that reflects the benefits that energy efficiency uh, can provide. So in order to do that, we engaged in a, a stream of work that we call the multiple benefits of energy efficiency improvements. I can't remember whether last year I had mentioned it, but uh, we've continued on this uh, line. And what we have here is something we sometimes refer to as the flower, the energy, the flower of multiple benefits. Uh, and what we try to do in this through this work stream is to raise awareness around the benefits of energy efficiency, fuel imports, energy security and the like, increase the analysis of benefits that go beyond simply energy savings or even greenhouse gas uh, uh, mitigation, improve methodological tools and build capacity. So for example, something that we see uh, is that cities and other subnational entities often don't have the capacity to fully evaluate the potential benefits of energy efficiency. So it becomes much easier to think about building another uh, pumping station for water rather than thinking about uh, improving the efficiency of uh, the existing uh, water pumping facilities. And so uh, we just, uh, last month, uh, actually two months ago, our executive director launched this book called Capturing the Multiple Benefits of Energy Efficiency. Uh, we focused in on five substantive areas that were identified by our membership, macroeconomic benefits, impacts on public budgets, uh, health benefits, uh, industrial productivity and energy providers. And I'll take you through them really uh, relatively quickly. Uh, in terms of macroeconomic Im impacts, this is probably the area that's been studied the most. It's been studied a lot in the United States and other countries, but fundamentally in summary you see two major type of uh, macroeconomic impacts. Uh, one is uh, the investment effects from investing in energy efficiency, job creation and the like. This is something that people like to focus in on. But obviously you also have the benefits from energy demand reduction effects and that's obviously very important in countries that uh, 
are very dependent on fuel imports, uh, whether it's a large country like Japan, or whether it's a country that's a virtual island in many ways like Korea, or uh, a country like Jamaica. We looked at the issue of public budgets, the impacts on cities, but also the impacts on municipal utilities such as water, uh, water and sewerage companies, or in public buildings. Uh, so for example, there's a large program in, in Canada to improve uh, lighting efficiency uh, in buildings where they were able to m mobilize about $300 million uh, in investment that produces about $40 million in savings. One of the ones I actually like to talk the most about is the, is the potential benefit of energy efficiency in terms of health and well-being. Now, a lot of the time people are starting to think about the issue of energy efficiency and its benefits in terms of health and well-being uh, when they think about air pollution, and obviously that's something that's important in China. But there was an interesting program uh, in New Zealand that had to do with indoor exposure factors, the second box in there, uh, and basically has to do with indoor air quality or particularly in poorer homes where you have bad insulation. So you'll go from a place near the wall as compared to the place near the window and you have a major differential uh, in temperature. The net result is people tend to get sick more and the like. And so they put in place a program in New Zealand, New Zealand to uh, support insulation improvements in homes and they found that uh, the health, the reduced health cost of those families uh, provided a four dollar return for each dollar of investment. So major impacts uh, from energy efficiency in some areas that you wouldn't necessarily think about, uh, health in terms of he indoor health. Industry, it's always interesting. People love to say that the private sector will always focus in on go where there's money. I think what we have tended to f find is the following, is that corporations tend to be good at what they're good at doing. And what they tend to be good at doing is value uh, creation, increasing sales, increasing market shares. They tend to think less about savings in some ways because savings has to do more with reducing things. So what we fundamentally want to do uh, as well is to sort of support industries to relook at the issue of energy efficiency as really a value creation proposition, uh, not simply a question of uh, produ uh, reducing energy. So as you try to become more energy efficient, uh, that can promote innovation uh, and improve your competitive position and the like. And then obviously energy providers, there's a lot of work on this in the United States, uh, in California and other places. And what you see here on the gray side is uh, the cost of energy efficiency investments as compared to on the right hand side, the type of benefits you can get in terms of reduced uh, technical transmission and distribution losses and the like. And then the other thing is when you improve energy efficiency, one of the major potential impacts is to improve affordability for consumers and that allows you uh, to sometimes uh, improve bill collection by reducing defaults. So uh, potential impacts for energy providers as well. And then obviously when we talk about energy efficiency, we have to talk about the rebound effect. So we recognize that it can in fact be a negative. Uh, if you think about energy savings, if that's your goal or reducing climate uh, change greenhouse gas emissions, uh, clearly you have to think about the rebound effect and that'll be a negative. But it can also be a positive. Uh, the fact of the matter is if you're trying to promote uh, economic development in a poor country and you improve affordability so that families have more money to spend on other things, uh, if they choose to spend it on a personal computer for their child and that increases energy consumption, that is not a negative impact. The objective there was to improve standards of living and you've achieved that. And then the other thing is sometimes it's not even relevant. This issue about uh, insulation really doesn't have a major impact in terms of energy consumption. It might indirectly, uh, but fundamentally not all benefits that are generated from energy efficiency uh, will generate uh, an energy rebound effect. Some do and some don't. And again, you have here this illustration of health. So one thing that's interesting about the multiple benefits approach to energy efficiency is it gives us insights into uh, maybe a, a more refined and subtle assessment of what is the rebound effect and when and when and how we should be concerned about it. When we think about energy efficiency, we have to think about national priorities. So again, Jamaica and Japan uh, will be very concerned about fuel imports while uh, Russia will be less concerned about that, uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, interestingly enough, is looking at energy efficiency as well of uh, preserving its, its resources for export. It's a big issue for developing countries there's clear link to access. Uh, a best one way to provide electricity to more people is by reducing the losses. You don't always have to build another coal power plant. Uh, combating local pol air pollution is a, a big issue in many countries. So for, for many developing countries in particular, energy efficiency provides some important benefits. Uh, 
And then I think one point to make is, is just the strategy that we see around multiple benefits. It isn't a question of saying that energy efficiency produces 15 benefits. As somebody said, that's the kiss of death when it comes to any policy initiatives to say it produces 15 benefits, but rather to focus in on some of them in terms of dealing uh, with key stakeholders. For, so, for example, this issue of development, uh, whether it's uh, energy access or uh, uh, poverty alleviation, to focus in on those players and say energy efficiency can deliver that benefit for you, or the illustration I gave about health. So it's really identifying who is the key stakeholder, what's the key priority interest, and seeing whether energy efficiency uh, can serve that goal, and then building uh, 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 allegiances that way. So we want to continue to do work in this regard, because at the end, coming back to the point I made at the beginning, when we look to the future, what we see is that of the economically profitable uh, energy efficiency investments out there, uh, under current policies and practices, we're only going to invest in about one-third. That means for every dollar that we invest in an energy efficiency investment under current policies and practices, we project that there are another two dollars of investments that we're not making, and that means we're leaving a lot of money on the table and we're leaving a lot of benefits on the table, and that was one reason why we wanted to move forward with these two publications. And as a final note, Guy, let me give you a copy of both. Thank you very much. Well, that, uh, that actually answers one of the comments I was, <laughs> you know, I think the multiple benefits uh, work that you've done since we last saw you and, uh, and uh, in addition to the, the, the 2014 report is outstanding. And one of the points I would, is IEA is a great place, and, but it has limited, there's only so much you can do, obviously, most effectively within your own member countries, but as you pointed out, increasingly important to uh, deploy these benefits in the places where most of the growth is going to be. So uh, how are, I mean, I know you, you personally and uh, IEA has been involved in things like G20 and, and other multilateral organizations. I suppose that's one way of getting the word out. Is there any, are there other ways of, it's nice to do great reports and, and uh, show, because the benefits is, I think, to all of us sitting around here saying, well, this is obvious, this is a, a no-brainer, uh, all those benefits, whether they're 15 or, or 100, uh, especially the point you made about health, which uh, one would not, would not necessarily think about. Other, other ways you, you at the IEA and, and other multilateral organizations are, are getting this to where to, at the deployment stage? Okay, uh, I, uh, I think you raise a variety of important points in, in, in that series of questions. The first is, and I think it's something to, to, that we recognize in the multiple benefits book, is that we really drew uh, largely on the expertise outside the IEA. Uh, there are obviously many institutions that do a much uh, deeper analysis of the macroeconomic benefits, uh, the health benefits, obviously, uh, and the like. So what we have tried to do through this effort is really to provide a, a platform for changing the nature of the discourse. But ultimately, the analysis will depend on a variety of the key policymakers outside of the IEA. Uh, what we've been struck and pleased by is the amount of interest people have had uh, in having us present this information. Uh, so we've gotten a large demand for the multiple benefits presentation, more than for the market report, yeah. probably from about 15, 20 countries, and normally from the energy specialists who say it's very useful for them that an organization, an energy agency like the IEA has put out this, this type of approach. Uh, and then what we hope is two things will happen. First of all, it will facilitate uh, national stakeholders' discussions within the national context uh, to try to get others interested in. So, for example, Denmark has said they want to figure out a way how to use this, this analysis. Canada is already doing a lot of this uh, uh, explicitly in the context of multiple benefits, and they want to figure out how to, how to use it. And then the other thing we want to do is to see how we can maybe, through our multilateral dimension, provide a platform uh, for specialists uh, to come together. We are having discussions in the context of the G20, but I think the G20 is going to focus in on different aspects. But the other thing is we have a program now to, to work more closely with a variety of key emerging economies. Uh, and what we have found is a strong interest in many of these emerging economies to try to get a better handle on the 
uh, key benefits from energy efficiency investments. And so we have a program uh, with India and with Mexico to uh, help them improve their analysis uh, of some of the macroeconomic benefits, for example. And you, you pointed out the, the oil producing countries are very interested, and we've had done some work with the, the King, King Abdullah Research Center, and they're working on a issue uh, on some uh, I issues on efficiency standards. And for them, it's uh, in addition to just being reaping the benefits of having more uh, energy to export, which is their main business. It's the fact that they subsidize energy consumption in Saudi Arabia and many oil producing countries. And to the extent they're more efficient, they can reduce their subsidies. It's kind of a roundabout way of getting, but I think the goal is the same. One, I had one question before I open to the floor is um, on the specifics. It was one chart, I think it was the one that showed the breakdown between structural change and efficiency. It looked like it was slowing down and now whether that's sort of an aftermath of the recession or, or what, but the period 09 to 2011 in that research, uh, it looked like that improvements in efficiency. And I just wanted your comment on that. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, that's exactly right. It, it was more, I think it was from 2007 to 2009. And, that, and even after that, so what happened was I can go back, but basically it improved. Uh, then it then it got worse, uh, and then it started to improve. It started to improve again, and and basically, um, like for example, in countries, I think one of the examples we have is Greece or the like. You know, as your as your capacity factor diminishes because you're facing a recession, a lot of time your your energy efficiency. Uh, d diminishes, so th you're absolutely right. But we've seen uh, now a more recent uh, up uptick in terms of improvement, and that's also reflected in the WIO report, which uh, Fati will describe next week. So it's not we're reaching point, you know, diminishing no. opportunities. As your last chart showed, you got a lot, we have lots of opportunities. Uh, we're spending maybe one dollar instead of you know th three for every in each of those sectors. So well, let, let's open it up and. The usual ground rules here, if uh, you please identify yourself and your affiliation and, uh, and uh, try to keep the uh, questions concise. Uh, who we've, uh, Michelle? Thank you. Uh, Michelle Melton, I'm, uh, I'm with the CSIS Energy Program. Thank you. That was a really interesting presentation. I have two questions. Um, I may have just missed it, but I didn't actually see anything on costs of energy efficiency, rel like LCOE relative to some of these other fuels, and I was wondering if you were doing any work on that. And the second is related to EMV protocols. Are you doing any work to standardize or encourage uh, standardization of EMV protocols? Thanks. Define, maybe some people may not know it. Sorry, EMV, um, Evaluation, Measurement, and Verification. I think that's what it stands for. It's a, it essentially um, being able to have, when we think about it in the U.S., we think about it state to state. They have different requirements for um, what counts as energy efficiency and how you measure it against a baseline. Can we take a few? And, okay, no? yeah, maybe we should, if, if, if we would be more efficient, is, are there, uh, Bob? I'm Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, could you give us some idea how this breaks down between uh, residential and industrial and utilities? One more, All right. yes sir. My name is Frank Barron, I'm a private investor. I appreciate very much your presentation and your information. It's uh, very, very enthusiastically being embraced by myself. A question I have in the United States right now, we have a very strong momentum in the LEEDS certification activity going on, architectural financing and so on and so forth. Can you comment on that LEEDS? Is that a passing phenomenon? Do you see that as a real structural change within America or within the world from an architectural standpoint? Okay, great. Um, I'd like to take many of them, and that way I can ignore one and if I need to. <laughs> Um, so, uh, in terms of, interesting on the issue of costs, so the costs are the 300 billion, the 310, the, the 310 billion. Uh, in terms of rates of return, 
which is kind of more, I think, part of your question was getting at. I think, you know, the interesting, the interesting problem that we sometimes face on the energy efficiency side is you end up uh, for some investments with, with rates of return that are too high and sort of incredible to people. So um, the purpose of this objective is less to sort of look at the issue to sort of say, or at least on the market report, to say, oh, look, here are these wonderful rates of return, uh, but rather to sort of say, you need to be thinking about energy efficiency and comparing what is your potential rate of return on an energy efficiency investment as opposed to going out and spending money and putting solar panels on your roof. So if I could give an illustration, I, rem I, I was doing a presentation to the uh, energy minister's meeting of the European uh, Union, and one of them said, you know, they have an issue because uh, they know, they find it's much easier to encourage people to put solar panels on their roof, even though it's going to be much more cost effective for them to put insulation in their homes. So I think one of the, what we sort of feel in the energy efficiency side, I'm sure you feel this as well, is that in fact there are a lot of extremely cost effective investments that aren't taking place. Uh, and how can we encourage people to do that? And that's what these reports are designed to do. In the multiple benefits publication, you'll see a variety of illustrations of investments that have uh, very high returns. Uh, the other thing is, in that regard, it's sort of embedded in another uh, form of analysis. If you actually look at the IEA's uh, projections or scenario analysis in terms of how you can decarbonize the energy sector, what you'll tend to see is that energy efficiency investments tend to be front-loaded as compared to even renewables. And the reason for that is because energy efficiency investments tend to be cost-effective relative to uh, some of the renewables uh, investments. So, um, and, then I, and then I think generally what we're, we're trying to do, uh, not just in terms of monitoring, evaluation, and evalu monitoring and evaluation, um, is, is we want to get, we want to encourage an improvement in the state of the art as a general proposition of, across different countries. And the fact of the matter is, for example, if you look at the macroeconomic impacts of energy efficiency, a lot of countries, or even states in the United States, are doing extremely sophisticated analysis, and other countries are doing a less sophisticated analysis. So in some ways, maybe for us, we're not quite at the point of doing sort of an ISO sort of standardization effort, though we think that would be useful, but even just getting people to do a better job about sharing. Uh, I was just uh, in India uh, 10 days ago uh, to talk to the Bureau of Energy Efficiency there that's very interested in improving the way uh, that they do an assessment of the uh, economic uh, impacts, and we brought in some specialists uh, from, from other countries. Uh, in terms of the breakdown of the 300 billion, I don't have a breakdown by sector. And in fact, we, because of the way the methodologies are done, we, haven't, we wouldn't actually be able to generate a breakdown uh, by sector uh, at, at this point. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, on the issues uh, of buildings and, and, and you know, the, the gold standards and, and the like that you see in different countries, what we're seeing is that is uh, becoming increasingly popular. It's also very popular, for example, uh, in Europe where they do use a, a slight variation. And so we think that's something uh, that's uh, going to continue. Obviously, what will be very exciting is to see that type of practice uh, being spread into emerging economies. People love to say, you know, the, the data on buildings, uh, if you think out to 2050, 80% of the buildings that all exist in 2050 in OECD countries are already built. So the big challenge there is on the renovation side. And 80% of the buildings that will exist in 2050 uh, have yet to be built when you look at some of the uh, emerging economies. So uh, clearly that overall uh, effort directionally we think is a uh, positive. Uh, sometimes it gets a little complicated and uh, there are sometimes problems that people sort of realize and uh, things, uh, strange incentives that play out and even the way you measure it, but as a general proposition, uh, I think it's a positive evolution. Phil, bring me up to date. Uh, we, we used to do uh, at the IEA uh, these policy peer reviews for our member countries. Europe. Uh, is that still going on? And the data that you now have for these 18 countries ought to be yielding some lessons learned, and some countries look like they were doing relative, a better, getting to Michelle's question, a better, let's say, return on investment on some of those. Are, are, are you at the point now where you'll be able to use the data you're collecting in your report to as an input to these uh, policy reviews that the IEA does for each member country on a, 
on a regular basis? Okay, so, so the policy reviews you're talking about are probably in-depth reviews. In -depth reviews. Um, so I, I, I think it's more, it's a symbiotic relationship. Normally the person that does the energy efficiency uh, part of the in-depth review for a particular country comes out of the same unit that does the market report. Uh, and so, for example, when we did the in-depth review, we only do two or three or four countries a year, but we just, uh, we're in the process of doing it for one for the European Union, and obviously some of the information that we got from the in-depth review goes into the market report, and the market report helps inform us in terms of the in-depth review. At a certain point, the, uh, the IEIA, we issued our 25 policy recommendations on energy efficiency, uh, and there was a major pushback from countries in terms of having us evaluate how they were doing in terms of progress on that, because their view was, well, we haven't said that we want to do the 25 policy recommendations, so we don't think it's fair for you to evaluate uh, how we're progressing uh, in that regard. As a general proposition, <laughs> what we find uh, is we issued something that's now absorbed in this report. We issued one, something called a scoreboard, which sort of gave a sense of how some countries were doing in terms of energy efficiency. I note the word scoreboard as opposed to scorecard. Yeah. Uh, and that was not a very popular effort. So uh, the fact of the matter is um, countries uh, uh, are often, often resist comparisons to other countries. And to be frank, there's a lot of validity in that because to compare across different countries, you have to start factoring in, if you're looking at energy use issues, you know, climate issues and the like, where are they coming from, it starts becoming very messy. So what we have tried to do is less look at how countries compare to each other, but rather focus in on how countries can continue to improve themselves. The last thing I would say is I threw up uh, that slide that showed the 18 countries and I can tell you that where we tend to get the biggest comments from countries is the look, you, you don't look at them, but I can, I can tell you there are two or three countries in there that called us and said, wait a second, why does that data look like that? We don't, it's not consistent with our data. We had to go back and forth and we realized sometimes we were using a different time frame and the like. So we're trying to remain in the positive and constructive vein of sort of supporting countries and improving what they're doing rather than getting in the gr in notion of grading them. Yeah, even after 40 years, there's still a lot of sensitivity of being uh, graded among your peers. So, uh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Tanimoto. I'm a visiting fellow here uh, from Japan Bank for International Cooperation. And uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. And my intention is that the great driver for the energy efficiency is the uh, energy price, the high energy prices. And uh, I'm curious about the uh, you know, recent stagnation in the energy price will lead to the you know, slowdown of the energy efficiency market or current price is still high enough for uh, the you know, promotion. Thank you. We have another question or two that for Phil before uh, make it. Yes, sir. Always uh, energy storage consultant and adjunct faculty at Tufts University. Actually, the question I have here is not a question. I'd like to get your feeling about not energy efficiency, but energy waste. Especially, I'm uh, looking into developing countries. Would they be possible to benefit from the work you guys you are doing, or they are still at a lower level, and they are still there in the area of how to improve? the waste of energy before they get into energy efficiency. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Yun Yang from Millennium Project Intern. Um, I want to ask you about um, your opinion about and uh, <coughs> which one is better or um, more important that uh, raising more energy efficiency or developing more renewable energies uh, in the long-term perspective. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, so on the, issue, on the issue of prices, so what we find not surprisingly is there are two major drivers of investment in energy efficiency. One is gonna be policies and the other is gonna be prices. So what we find on the, on the prices side, I, I agree with you totally, it's, 
uh, I think there, there, there are two issues there. On the one hand, some of the, some of the discussions we have internally is people want uh, transparent, flexible prices that adjust with, a, with the market. Uh, and sometimes we have the date, debate internally that say, yeah, that's useful to support energy efficiency, but at the end of the day, what's probably going to drive energy efficiency investments is what is the absolute level of prices rather than uh, how pure uh, is the price from a market perspective. So clearly, I think when you're looking at a situation where prices are high, uh, <coughs> energy efficiency becomes, relatively speaking, uh, more profitable uh, and, at the, uh, and similarly, uh, um, psychologically more appealing. You tend to see an increase in energy efficiency investments when you have uh, that type of uh, increase in prices and also an expectation that prices are going to stay high. Having said that, uh, there are two issues that we see in terms of the price environment um, that operate to the disfavor of, of energy efficiency. Um, the first is obviously fossil fuel subsidies, price subsidies, uh, that uh, lower the lower the price of fossil fuels uh, consumption and so make uh, lead to overconsumption of, fo of fossil fuels, but also means th that, uh, relatively speaking, an energy efficiency investment is, is less appealing. And then the second thing is the fact of the matter is uh, that, looking again at fossil fuels or even to a certain extent renewables, we don't, we don't adequately internalize into the price of those fuels uh, some of the externalities. <laughs> so one of which is obviously uh, air quality uh, impact, but even things like, I'll come back to your point about renewables. I mean, uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, the, fact, the fact of the matter is, one can argue often, energy efficiency, uh, it's, it's, it's not only the cleanest fuel, so it's, it's really probably cleaner in some ways you could argue than, uh, well, it's cleaner than fossil fuels, but there are other important benefits from energy efficiency. Uh, for example, many utilities are concerned about the water energy stress, but they're also very concerned about the land issue. Uh, and when you build a renewables uh, a generation generating facility, you need a fair amount of land. You need land for, for the wind turbines, you need land for the hydro, you need land for the, the, the transmission lines. These are things that you, you don't need uh, when you look at uh, energy efficiency. So maybe I'm a little biased. I have two hats. Uh, one is energy efficiency, but my other hat is on the climate change perspective. Uh, and I think often uh, energy efficiency investments are preferable uh, to, to renewables. Obviously, they don't generate the kilowatt hours, and so at the end of the day, you need to get the kilowatt hours somewhere. Uh, but as a general proposition, if your objective, for example, is uh, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, as I mentioned earlier, what you'll tend to see is that energy efficiency provides a larger contribution under our scenarios uh, than than renewables, that energy efficiency will only take you, will only take you so far. So coming back to the pricing issue again, uh, I think I think we all see this. Higher prices uh, tend to result in a greater interest in energy efficiency, and there are two important things that are happening that are arguably distorting prices: fossil fuel subsidies and the fact that we're not internalizing uh, into the prices uh, the variety of costs uh, that uh, those forms of uh, fossil fuel consumption, in particular in particular will, will generate. And then on the issue of energy waste, so I'll, I'll flip it around. Um, it's a point we often make, I think it's in the, it's in the slide on, on the access point. Um, uh, energy waste, one thing that is critical in, in, in developing countries uh, is they often face, they have inefficient supply systems. There's a lot of, they have distribution systems that are ineffective in part because as the demand for electricity grows in an urban area, you have more people connecting to the same transformers. Those transformers are overheating. You have uh, reduced efficiency of the transformers. You have significant loss of electrons. You need more power plants <laughs> to provide electricity to the same number of people. It would be much more efficient uh, to basically put in more transformers, improve the efficiency of the whole delivery system, and not have to build another coal power plant. I mean, it's interesting, a lot of the time, some of the people who are pushing the access point tend to be people who invest in coal power generation, and that's uh, not uh, a coincidence. And so clearly, um, we spend less time focusing on developing countries, but we did note it here, uh, a critical benefit of energy efficiency is really supply side uh, interventions, and, and they're reducing waste, using energy efficiency to reduce waste uh, is a critical part of the story. And it's also very important that the OECD countries, we tend to focus very much on end-use energy efficiency, 
uh, we need to be thinking at a global level more of supply side issues. And we think there may actually be, we'll have to look at it a little more, even some more supply side opportunities uh, even within efficient to OECD countries as well. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Um, I am an intern here at the energy program. My name is Xiao Qun. Um, I have a question about uh, electric vehicles. I noticed that they are not included in the transportation uh, analysis. However, um, they are electric vehicles, I think they are more efficient than inner combustion vehicles. And I want to know about IA's view about um, the future role that these type of uh, vehicles can be in energy efficiency. Thank you. Any other questions? Be this might be, yes, well, if you could come to the microphone, because we're doing a webcast of this. Yes, uh, uh, Paul Dolan, so, uh, a consultant. Just a, a question about uh, the utilities uh, revenue models. You know, gener energy efficiency is often seen as reducing utility revenues. And uh, how, how is that being dealt with? Uh, We have one last question for Phil. Well, otherwise, that'll be it. Phil, last two questions. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so, uh, agreed totally electric vehicles are part of the energy efficiency story in transport, and we have a document we focused in on certain areas, and we focused in on what we felt were important points. Uh, one was to get people to think about the fact that when you have fuel economy standards for vehicles, there's actually an energy efficiency <laughs> investment that's taking place there. So that was one of the major focuses. But to come to the point about electric vehicles, it's in a lot of the IEA's analysis. Uh, I'm actually doing a presentation tomorrow on the transport sector, and I could have thrown up this slide. And you're right, electric vehicles uh, present two types of uh, advantages um, from uh, efficiency and a climate change perspective. One is, as you note, uh, it's a more efficient use of energy, and so uh, you get a, a, a plus there, uh, as well as if you sort of uh, go to a, uh, a grid system that is largely uh, decarbonized, you also get a benefit from using electricity that comes from renewables, uh, or largely renewables, as opposed to one that comes from uh, oil. Uh, and in fact, uh, interestingly enough, I think one of my colleagues, my transport colleagues, showed me is that that two thirds of the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions comes from the improved efficiency of the electric vehicle as compared to the internal combustion engine, and only one third of the benefit, at least under our scenario analysis, comes from the fact that you're drawing electricity from a decarbonized uh, energy uh, grid. Um, so, agreed, electric vehicles are very much uh, and part of the uh, energy efficiency story as is, as was mentioning earlier, um, shifting to, uh, to <coughs> rail systems and the like. Those are also provide uh, important uh, uh, energy, more energy efficient uh, benefits and with uh, corresponding investments. One of our objectives, again, in the market reports to say to people, there is a market out there. There is money to be made. There is money that people are going to spend. There's a lot of money that people are going to spend. And in fact, coming back to an overall issue, when we look at uh, where we think uh, we would need to be in order to decarbonize the, uh, the energy sector to achieve the two degree goal, under our scenarios, we estimate that uh, investments, annual investments in energy efficiency will need to equal about $600 billion a year over a 22 year period. That compares to $300 billion. And so what that basically means is we need to see a massive increase uh, in the amount of investments in energy efficiency. Uh, policies will be key, price will be key, but price is always a little funny because at the end of the day, I think we all prefer to, to live in a world in which energy prices are not very high. So we need to probably find other levers to, to encourage investment uh, in, in energy efficiency. Um, and then the other issue about uh, utilities, yes, I mean, that is one of the classic uh, challenges. Uh, getting utilities to change their time frame, their mindset from thinking that more assets is better for the economy. The fact of the matter is more assets, and you see this in emerging economies as well as in other places, more assets translates into more economic power. Uh, so there's clearly an incentive for uh, many industries to increase their asset base, to basically increase their weight and importance uh, in the economy, and it's up to the regulators and others to really change that incentive framework, and obviously we see that taking place in 
in, in states like California where you have to sort of reward the negawatt in the same, the, the, the watt that you save uh, in the same way that you reward uh, the watt that you produce. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much, Phil, and uh, thank you all for coming in. Please uh, join me in uh, giving Phil a warm thank you for this morning's performance. Thank you.